Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, good evening everyone, and I would like to welcome you in uh, our grand round format, this is uh, grand round number seven, and as you know, we since we started this grand round, uh, we have been moving it around in the Middle East, so we had the uh, first episode from Egypt, then Jordan, then Qatar, uh, then UAE, and then today our grand round will be actually from uh, Saudi Arabia. Uh, <clears throat> our guest for the grand round today will be uh, Dr. Jubara Alala. She's actually a, a very dear colleague to me and a dear friend from a long time. Uh, uh, since I used to work in Saudi Arabia in the National Guard Hospital, uh, so actually we've been colleagues for the last at least uh, 10, 12 years now. Uh, so I'd like to welcome Dr. Jubara Alala for the mm -hmm. uh, Grand Round format. Um, Dr. Jubara Alala, she's a professor of pediatrics and a consultant neonatologist at King Saud uh, Ben Abdul Aziz University for Health Science. And she's also a consultant at King Abdul Aziz Medical City in Jeddah. Uh, she's actually currently practicing in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. <clears throat> um, Dr. Jubara will join us uh, shortly as she has a call from her hospital and uh, we're actually waiting for her to uh, join this meeting. Uh, until Dr. Jubara join us, I'd like just to remind you that uh, we have actually uh, different formats for the online format. We have this format is the grand round. And the grand round is basically like an interesting case presentation. And as I said, we have been moving this grand round uh, uh, format uh, through the Middle East. Um, uh, we had, I said, from Kuwait, from Qatar, from Oman, from uh, Jordan, Egypt, and this time in Saudi Arabia. Um, the other format we have is the is a new virtual. With, where we uh, uh, present uh, interesting topics. Sir. Here we present case presentation, and that's why there is no title actually for the lecture. Uh, sometimes we like to hide the... So uh, we can... Uh, our other format is the new virtual and we present sometimes uh, interesting uh, cases there, as I said, interesting topics. Uh, this is the two format that we have for the online. <clears throat> we'll, maybe we'll take the chance also to advertise for uh, the conference, which is going to be on the 10th and the 11th of May. And this will be the multi-specialty conference in Abu Dhabi. And the theme this year is about uh, all about respiratory care and the neonatal ICU. Um, this will be in uh, May 10, 11, inshallah. <clears throat> but from May 10, 10, May 10 first will be an online format. So we will have uh, four international speakers. Uh, they will be uh, presenting virtually in the 10th at night. And the physical part of the conference will start on uh, the 11th and the 12th. Uh, and this is it's not going to be projected virtually. It's only going to be uh, f uh, physical, physical attendance. And it's all about respiratory care, as I said. So we're going to learn there uh, whatever update about our the respiratory care for the neonatal ICU. 
we will start our session when Dr. Jubara uh, join us, inshallah. Um, there is a question and answer button. You can uh, uh, click uh, the question and answer. And the uh, discussion will be after, J J after Dr. Jubara finish her presentation. Um, I think I can see now Dr. Jubara joined in. So welcome Dr. Jubara to our format. And uh, I already introduced you uh, and I will leave the floor for you. Dr. Jubara, can you start? Cannot hear you. I think she's connecting to audio, so hopefully it will take maybe a couple of seconds. Inshallah, will work. Uh, I think Dr. Jibara still has some technical issues with her voice, with her audio. She's trying to hook her audio to the, to the format. It takes just another couple of minutes. <clears throat> So we were talking about our uh, online format. Uh, the, this format is the, uh, this is the grand round format and we have another format we said, <coughs> the new virtual. <coughs> we were also um, reminding you about our physical conference, which will be in May uh, from 10 to 12. Um, the, uh, from the 10, 10 part, May 10 will be the online format and uh, 11 and 12 will be a physical uh, conference. Uh, we also have uh, our respiratory uh, mechanical ventilation conference and that uh, usually we do twice per year. Um, uh, we did it this year in Dubai and also in, in Abu Dhabi. So this is also uh, something we do like twice a week, twice a year once in Dubai and once in Abu Dhabi here. I think Dr. Jubar is still trying to link to us.
Okay, I can think we can hear you, Dr. Jubara. Finally, I'm going to ask you a question. Alhamdulillah, can you start now? Okay, sure. Can you see my slides? Uh, no, I can see myself. <laughs> and I'm going to share the slide. When the slide is there, just let me know. I share the slide. I still cannot see your slides. Can you hear me now? I can hear okay. you, but we cannot see you. And I cannot see your Type slides. Up. Type and I share the slide again. Share. Now I can see you. Can you see my? You can oh, see a slide? slide. No. What do you see in your screen? And I see my my screen. Uh, oh, my no, slides. Okay. I started sharing screen sharing. Double click to enter okay. full screen. Can you see it? Yes. Oh, oh yeah. Huh. Yeah. Good. Bye. <coughs> okay. We need to start. You can start. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Hello, everybody. It's my pleasure to be with you tonight. And thank you, Prof. Uh, Hisham. Uh, for this opportunity uh, given to me for sharing some of this uh, you know, um, interesting uh, you know, webinar. I will start uh, my presentation with a case. The case we see it in, in, in our unit. This is a baby girl uh, who was born to our hospital. Uh, the baby... Um, born at term and uh, uh, born by uh, SVD. She had some meconium stain like her, uh, born with a good score, eight, minute at, eight at one minute and nine at five minutes. Her core pH was within normal. Uh, baby transferred to the nursery, but it has been called uh, to see and assist this baby at two hours of age, okay? And that due to cyanosis and desaturation noted by the nursery nurse. So the baby admitted to in ICU and she was started on nasal cannula, two liter. Uh, but the baby still, her saturation was not improved. So she was a switch to high flow nasal cannula with 100% FI2. But at that time, the saturation was not improving for, for this baby. So history, there is a positive consanguinity. They are first degree cousin. And uh, one of her sibling died at the age of eight years of age and labeled as a case of cerebral palsy due to hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy at birth. She had other two siblings, both of them were normal. On physical examination, the baby looked very well. She was not distressed. There was no dysmorphic feature. Her growth parameter was uh, were within normal, her height and weight, her circumference. Uh, her chest were clear. Her cardiac examination within normal. There was no cardiac murmur, perfusion, pulses where it was uh, palpable. Uh, her abdomen, there was no really abnormalities. And neurological examination all within normal for age. 
So uh, I'm not sure. Do we have like uh, sharing uh, uh, chat where you know uh, attendee can have some uh, clue to Prof Hisham? So can we do some yeah like uh, uh, chat where they can give us some differential diagnosis? Uh, no, we can pause for one minute, and if somebody have a suggestion, he can write it in the question and answer. If somebody okay. has a answer, we can put one minute or so. So far, I don't have any. Okay. So, okay. So if, uh, yeah. So if this case, a baby, oh, full term baby, there is no. Yeah. So there's some answer here, and the uh, no, I have uh, somebody say it's a congenital. Yeah, I can see it. Congenital heart, heart. disease. Somebody said somebody TGA. Say TGA. TGA. Yeah. Okay, what else could be? Meconium aspiration. Congenital heart disease. Congenital heart disease. Okay, okay. Good. More answer. Pulmonary stenosis. Pulmonary stenosis. Okay. Okay, so we'll go. So, the French diagnosis, as you know, a baby who had a uh, full term baby, uh, no nothing antenatally uh, born, and then develop cyanosis later, uh, include a lot of differential diagnosis, including cardiac, number one, which is really common, like TGA, transposition of credit arteries, tetralogic valves, uh, pulmonary atresia, total normal pulmonary venous drainage, tricuspatresia. Uh, truncus arteriosis. Um, so all form of congenital heart disease could present with this presentation. Other uh, respiratory causes like uh, respiratory distress syndrome, even a term, meconium aspiration, pneumonia, pipitrin, um, could be other causes like metabolic, neurological infection and other causes. So in this case, because we have a variety of differential diagnosis in this case. What you will do next for this baby? So a baby with respiratory dystrophy, not no respiratory, she had cyanosis and desaturation. What, in, what you will do for her now after you admit her to it? Can we see some answers? What you will do next for this baby? Pre post ductal saturation. Okay. What else? Is someone saying a chest x ray? Chest x ray. Okay, good. Septic screen. Uh, or lymph pressure. Okay. Prostaglandin infusion, blood pressure for limbs. Mm -hmm. So. Somebody write echo, chest x-ray. Okay, good. So this is what we do in these cases in, in general for such a presentation. So this is her chest x-ray. And the audience comment on the chest x-ray, please. What you can see in the x-ray? Phylogenic look, maybe. Egg shape, dry lung. What else? Can you see any, any other? Finding in the x ray? Can you see any other finding in the x ray? Can you pass this x ray as a normal? Or this is an abnormal x ray? What do you think?
Okay, so based on this finding, I mean, sorry, X-ray, actually this X-ray look normal, completely normal. You know, we cannot really find any abnormality in that X-ray. Uh, and this X-ray done while the baby in high flow needs a cannula, but to us, this X-ray is normal. So what next? We did the blood gas, and this is her blood gas. The initial blood gas was 7.5 the pH. The BCO2 is 21. Uh, BO2 86, and this is capillary gas. Bicarb was 16.6, and base deficit was only 0.6. This is on the on admission. We repeated the blood gas. Uh, we you know because the saturation was not improving. We put the baby on 100 percent of I2, and this is the repeated blood gas after uh, giving the baby 100 percent oxygen. And pH was 7.5, PCO2 was 20, and PO2 jumped from 86 to 298. And uh, complete blood count came back as a normal. The, the cord CBC and the baby at like uh, four hour CBC were also normal. Uh, CRB was done on admission and it was negative. So what next? What you will do next? So we have a chest x-ray, we're normal. We have a C blood gas, you can see it. And normal CPC and CR. What next you will do for this baby? Echo, yeah, somebody suggested echo. Okay, anything else? So, it was done. And it was only small ASD, and there is no evidence of any critical congenital heart disease. And of course, the blood culture has been taken and antibiotics were started for this baby because, you know, an unclear presentation and one of our differential diagnoses were sepsis in this case, despite the negative uh, CRP and the CPC were within normal. So it was normal, chest X-ray normal. You could see the blood gas and, um, you know, no evidence of infection at this point. What you will do next? Any suggestion? <clears throat> Metabolic screen. We sent ammonia and lactate, and it were normal. Any suggestion? Brain ultrasound. Brain ultrasound were normal. Any other suggestion? Okay. So remember, all the time you have you have a baby who whose saturation is low, baby, not respiratory distress. It was normal, chest X-ray normal, and really look to the details. It came to my attention, her sibling who died at age of eight years and labeled as hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. I went back with the history with the parents. They told me it was the same, baby born. There is no difficulty in delivery. Baby went to the nursery, but she had the same presentation. And the baby was born in different hospital and then transferred to our center because the echo has found 
she had an ASD, similar to this case. So, I went back to the medical record, and you can see she was seen in our hospital at five weeks of age. She was product of SPD, full-term baby, there is nothing. And uh, she had diagnosis at birth, ne necessitate echo, and echo showed only ASD and patent uh, foramen uh, oval versus ASD anyway, and referred for our cardiology. But the mother noted the baby had a peripheral cyanosis during feeding and at rest. She was seen back to in, in our clinic, in the cardiology clinic, because of the follow of ASD, and noted at four months of age, she had increased tones in all lower limb, upper limb, fisting, scissoring at lower limb. So they, they refer her to uh, neurology and unfortunately labeled her as hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. And according to the parent, she was, you know, uh, getting worse till she was like um, bedridden, died at age of uh, eight years. And of course, they told them she died because of hypoxic ischemic injury because there is an history that cyanosis early in life. So this bring us to uh, a differential diagnosis. Impossible. Why she had a baby with the same presentation and ended by having CP and died with poor uh, neurological status. And now this baby had almost the same thing. So we did a test, a simple test. We looked air to her blood gas. And interestingly, you can see here, her methemoglobin was 30 almost was 29. Repeated gas, we looked for the affected sister in her previous, so in her, one of her admission to the pediatric ICU at age of four years, this is the only gas we found, and the her hemoglobin was 11.9 and 9.6 respectively. So this get us uh, a clue, it is most likely a myth hemoglobinemia. So an urgent target gene has been sent and it shown there is an hemozygous uh, various, uh, uh, I mean, um, mutation at uh, uh, cyber 5 reductase free gene. And based on that, we label her as autosomal recessive methemoglobinemia. So, management. So this is the baby. You can see here, she was blue, totally blue, despite of oxygen. She was 100% oxygen at that time. And we give a methylene blue, one milligram per kg. And it was really a magic. You can see a big difference and immediate response. And we did uh, blood gas within like one hour after methylene blue. And the methemoglobin dropped significantly from 28 to 2. So maybe has been started on... Um, after we consulted our methodology, we have a long, a long discussion about the management of these cases, and finally decided to um, start also ascorbic acid orally for her. Uh, and um, we kept her uh, for observation uh, for a couple of days. Uh, initially, uh, we discharged her. Uh, and we give her follow-up weekly to our clinic. 
and the decision was uh, to give her meth uh, uh, methylene blue if the meth hemoglobin more than 10. Actually, she required methylene blue in several occasion, and she was seen in the clinic with hemoglobin electrophoresis, which was done and was normal because one of the differential diagnoses is hemoglobin M. Uh, G6PD was a mandatory screen, and it was normal for, for this baby. So, genital methemoglobinemia is a very rare cause of cyanosis. And uh, it's really best described by the increased and sustained concentrate, concentration of the exo, uh, exo, uh, exodized meth hemoglobin. Causes, there is different um, causes for congenital or acquired uh, um, uh, meth hemoglobinemia. So uh, due to congenital change in hemoglobin synthesis, or can be a due to functional deficiency in the enzyme, which is responsible for reducing the methemoglobin in normal erythrocytes. And the normal condition, if we check for anybody, the level of methemoglobin should be less than one. So this is a, a um, Metric uh, representation of the mechanism that causes meth hemoglobin. So maybe I can show you with this. Um, the the upper part it showed um, uh, the 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 hereditary cause due to the cyber uh, five uh, reductase three mutation or drug ingestion, which lead. Uh, uh, it, uh, any any uh, mutation in this uh, um, gene will result uh, in uh, hereditary form of meth hemoglobinemia, and that important that gene important for uh, encoding for the NAD H cytochrome uh, and. Acquired cause could be due to drug ingestion and uh, and medication. These will affect the uh, change. I mean the 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 uh, NAD H cytochrome and leading to acceleration in the hemoglobin exudation from the ferrous form to ferric form, leading to the meth hemoglobin, and that also will lead to or will affect the oxygen dissociation curve, and will lead the effect of meth hemoglobin will push the hemoglobin dissociation curve to the left, and that will cause will that results in uh, increase the affinity of ferrous iron for the oxygen and impaired the oxygen release to the tissue result in hypoxia. And hypoxia, we call it uh, despite of normal hemoglobin. So this is what we call it functional anemia. So hemoglobin level is normal, but the baby will have a functional anemia. Other causes like uh, hemoglobin uh, mutation like hemoglobin M and other will will give the same presentation. Smith hemoglobinemia has been reported in early and in has been really uh, reported in uh, 1845. Francis, which is a French physician, where describe he described a patient with congenital cyanosis without any obvious cardiac or pulmonary abnormalities. In 1940, Gibson showed that these patients, usually they have uh, diminished the ability of the erythrocyte to reduce the meth hemoglobin. In 1959, Scott and Griffith identified the enzyme responsible for the reduction of meth hemoglobin. Uh, it is an autosomal recessive disorder, 
where majority of affected individuals, they are deficient in the enzyme, uh, which is the cytochrome B5 reductase, uh, due to uh, mutation in, in the cytochrome B5 reductase G. This is a famous paint, and uh, uh, it's called the blue skin forget family. Uh, it has been really, uh, uh, you know, uh, if you can see the father and some of the affected children, they were blue. And this is the family where it has been described and their family, this family lived between 1700 um, and 1850s. So it is existing, but maybe the milder form of these. And this is really the, the family tree of those uh, family where they have uh, a, a hereditary methemoglobinemia. So it's really described in the literatures. How common? Uh, it is really maybe underreported because when we looked for how many cases has been affected, so I think most of the cases, like the sister of our case, uh, it was misdiagnosed and she was labeled as different. She was labeled as hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. And most of these types, like types two, especially where they have neurological impairment, they are mislabeled. So in the literature, uh, in 2017, I found this paper, they collect all cases with their name and age and none of the not all of them they have a, a genetic diagnosis uh, so it has been in the literature only 11 cases has been really reported so incidence really it's un, not known uh, because the misdiagnosis or underdiagnosis but it has been estimated in some literature, it's one in 100,000 cases. And it has been reported in, 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 in uh, some area, it have higher incidence than what has been reported. In Saudi Arabia, we have really an incidence of cases of, uh, uh, or in the, even in the Gulf uh, area about the cases of methemoglobinemia, when we looked exactly about the reported cases, I found only three cases. So two of them, uh, two siblings with congenital methemoglobinemia type two, and uh, they have genetic uh, diagnosis. And both of them, they have bas basal ganglia hypophagia. And that's why maybe if you didn't have a de de uh, definitive genetic diagnosis and the baby with mental retardation who had basal ganglia hypoplasia infection, people will think of an HIE and mislabel them as that. Uh, this is the third case, but it's an, an, an uh, older one where uh, has been reported in adolescents but there was no genetic testing has this case, but the diagnosis has been based on the uh, level of uh, cytochrome B5 reductase enzyme activities. Maybe common things is the common. So uh, the commonest may be uh, the drug in use or the exposure. And uh, this is really some of the symptoms were the, the presentation. Type 1, which is autosomal recessive, uh, and uh, the genetic uh, uh, defect or mutation in cytochrome B5 reductase, and they present uh, cyanosis since birth. While type 2, which is um, the same presentation, the same gene, but they have cyanosis plus neurological involvement. Okay? There is a type Five, where it's happened in uh, um, uh, babies with other associated malformation, uh, ambiguous genitalia, which is not the, the case, and the mutation in cytochrome B5A, not the reductase. And also we have hemoglobin M and unstable hemoglobin, and the same, the presentation cyanosis at birth. A lot acquired one may be the commonest where there is more than 126 
agent or drugs can lead to acquired methemoglobinemia. I will not go through that, but a lot of, of medication can cause that. Uh, let's go for the types. So type one is really considered to be the commonest and characterized by uh, decrease in the function uh, of the cytochrome B5 reductase in the uh, RPCs. And the methemoglobin concentration can reach up to 40%. And most pa those patients will adopt to increase the level of methemoglobin by compensatory polycythemia. And they don't have really much symptoms unless they are exposed to oxidizing agent. And those type, they have a normal life expectancy. The type two, which is the rare form, uh, and the deficiency will be in all type of cells, not only the RPCs. And unfortunately, their life expectancy has been short, and most of them, they died uh, early in life. What those baby characterized by? Cyanosis, of course, plus progressive neurological deterioration. They have mental retardation, difficult they may start as early as four months of life. And they die within the first few years of life. What is the symptoms? With hemoglobin less than 10, majority of a patient or affected patient will be asymptomatic. Cyanosis will be if the meth hemoglobin level uh, compared to the total hemoglobin, 10 to 20%. Um, in adults, you may have if 20 to 40 percent, they will have more general symptoms like dizziness, tachycardia, weakness, headache, fatigability, and of course, 40 to 50 will have this near lethargy because of the severe, um, you know, hypoxia and anemia, and of course, more than 70, it's very lethal. And between 50 and 70, they will start to have seizure, coma and arrhythmias and acidosis. So we can then, um, bedside test, you can, if you extract the blood of those baby, and it was one of the clue in our case, maybe you see it in the picture, the, the blood will be very dark. So you can see um, the normal color of the, of the, of the uh, yeah, normal babies or normal uh, people, it will be reddish. A babies or affected um, patient with methemoglobin, they have the blue, uh, I mean, the brown color blood. Cytochrome B5 five reductase activity test. It's used in adult or other, uh, other pediatric age group. But in units, unfortunately, because they have only 50% of normal adult level of cytochrome B5 reductase activity, so you cannot diagnose those baby if they are less than 12 months of age, because the first after one year, they may have the normal adult. And observing uh, the uh, reduced five uh, cytochrome B5 uh, reductase activity in leukocyte as well as erythrocyte will help in the diagnosis of type two with hemoglobinemia. Genetic test, I think uh, with the availability of uh, genetic testing uh, in, you know, uh, in most of the hospital, I think it's a crucial to have a genetic diagnosis for these cases. So whole exome sequences should be sent and they have a confirmation, especially if they, like our case, you have a baby with um, similar but undiagnosed or unknown cause of uh, neurodevelopmental impairment, progressive impairment, you need to think of that if your initial test or, or you have a high index of suspicion in these cases. Uh, hemoglobin electrophoresis uh, is really necessarily why you need to exclude other differential diagnoses like hemoglobinopathy, like hemoglobin M disease. And of course, G6PD screening is mandatory because if you start uh, with hemoglobin, I'm sorry, methylene blue treatment and the baby had G6PD, 
they will have acute hemolysis. So it's a mandatory to do it for all suspected cases of methemoglobinemia. Do we have like consensus? Unfortunately, in UNED, there is no, no recommendation when to treat and how to treat because of the, uh, uh, the, the disease is really rare. And if you look for any consensus, I remember when I called our hematology, uh, they said, okay, let's meet first. Let's discuss, let's review. And then we have a plan of the treatment because it's really, there is no consensus no recommendation about what type of treatment and when to treat and for how long we treat. So there is a several factor need to be considered in these cases, whether the patient's symptomatic, what is the total amount of methemoglobin, and what is the cause of methemoglobin, and of course, the age of the patient. And if there is any uh, additional factor will compromise the oxygen delivery. Like if those baby have a congenital heart disease, or if they have primary lung disease, BBD, or you know chronic lung disease, cystic fibrosis, for example, or if there is a significant anemia to start with. So as we said, we have they have functional anemia, and now if they have a low hemoglobin to start with, they may really compromise their oxygen delivery and will lead more and more of tissue hypoxia. So if you look for what option do we have? Number one is the methylene flu. Methylene flu is really uh, given in a dose 0.5 to 2 milligram per kg over five minutes. It's really dramatic the effect, you will see it. And within 30 minutes, you see the response. And in clinically, plus laboratory. It can be repeated, there is no response within one hour. It can be repeated. Methylene blue, as we know, it's a cofactor for nicotamide adenine, uh, not BH. So uh, uh, this really, as we said, uh, you cannot use it if the patient has G6PD because G G6PD, if you, any G6PD patient, if you give them uh, methylene blue, this will uh, lead to acute hemolysis. The G6BD, as we know, especially in the Mediterranean Gulf region, it's very high. So prevalence ranging 2.5 to 25%. And, you know, um, drug that are not very hemolytic in G6BD patient will cause over 10 times uh, more methemoglobin formation in G6PD subject. So that's why it's really important to check G6PD if you are suspecting a patient with methemoglobinemia. Uh, and the patient with G6PD also can develop methemoglobinemia after methylene flu. So that's why it's mandatory to check for any patient with, in our you know country now, it's mandatory screen and it's uh, included even in the newborn screen because the high prevalence of G6PD. Ascorbic acid. Ascorbic acid is a strong reducing agent and it takes uh, a part in many oxidation reduction reaction in, in, in human. So it can be used as a therapy and it has been reported uh, in different uh, cases uh, report and but no really strong recommendation or um, strong uh, available evidence about its effectiveness in newborn. The, liter the literature has been shown it has been used in pediatric and adult, but um, data in unit is very very limited. What about hyperbaric oxygen? It used in adult where it's uh, in a life-threatening cases, uh, especially if it's uh, drug-induced or uh, toxic. So hyperbaric oxygen will allow dissolving of the sufficient oxygen in the blood to maintain uh, important, the, the, the important uh, oxygenation. Uh, it is indicated as an adjuvant therapy for patients with severe methemoglobinemia, where the methemoglobin more than 15. And if those case, 
is not responded to methyl methylene blue and um, you know sometimes has been used in a preparation for uh, exchange transfusion in unit there is really no data about its use uh, uh, so as i said it's rare under diagnosis so you didn't have a data about its use in units what about exchange transfusion? We know exchange transfusion. We use it for methemo for um, you know hyperpilirubinemia and unate. Um, in adults and maybe with the pediatric age group, it has been used immediately. The methemoglobin is not responsive to methylene blue, and the level is high, and there is progressive symptomatic uh, involvement, like especially. Se severe anemia or a baby who had some underlying lung disease. And um, it has been approached to be used if the methemoglobin level more than 70. But unfortunately, there is no data for the unit. Can we use it at what level? There is really no data. So take home message in this case. Uh, congenital hemoglobinemia is really rare. But in case, if you have a patient with cyanosis without respiratory distress, and this is the clue, this should raise a suspicion in a clinician for the, this diagnosis. In neonatal population, there is no really uh, data about what we need to do, what is the doses, duration for how long, and what we need to do. So the treatment, according to uh, some literature, should be started as early as possible uh, due to limited compensatory capability in the first month of life. Prognosis, it depends on the type. As I said, type 1, they live normal life, uh, while most of type 2, they have poor outcome. And most of them, they die during the infancy and uh, i think by this i would like to thank you for being with me tonight and thank you dr uh, hisham and uh, all the audience tonight and i'm really happy to answer your question uh, thank you very, very much dr ajubara for the interesting case and a very nice presentation actually uh, and this was a very interesting case um, Dr. Bibian from Cornish Hostel, actually, she said that I, I gave the answer for methemoglobinemia before you start uh, any I I, 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 miss, I miss it, sorry. <laughs> yeah, and she asked, uh, is there any prize for her? Oh, the that prize. Dr. Uh, Dr. will uh, we'll contact you with a prize. <laughs> Dr. Bibian, <Don't> <laughs> so a, a prize. <laughs> Maybe she invited you to Saudi Arabia, I, probably. Oh Sure, sure. I was in there some before Ramadan. <laughs> uh, <laughs> inshallah, maybe I can inshallah. All of you, uh, do you see these cases, type 2 with hemoglobinemia? Um, I think um, I saw one case in my career and it's been a long time. Uh, not, not in uh, Saudi Arabia, not, I think one, one case I've seen in the States. Mm. Uh, it's not very common, like you said, it's very rare disease, yeah. Mm. But the diagnosis for it should be come by exclusion. Like, you know, when you exclude the respiratory and the congenital heart disease, then you start to think in this direction. We have some but questions the, actually in, here. In uh, this case, I think one, because like uh, this baby admitted 2 a.m. and I came in the morning, I looked at the blood color, you know, and it was yeah. really, really brown. So this, it's, like, it's shocking, yeah. It's high, yeah. yeah. Very, you know, you don't see a brown blood. The blood color is very, very interesting. So it was, this is the clue in that case. And immediately we get the methemoglobin level. And in, it was really yeah. 29. Life saving. And, you know, it's really life saving. And, yeah, interestingly, the, the cord uh, blood gas showed methemoglobin of 0. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. We have some okay. uh, comments and some questions here. 
Okay, go ahead. So uh, somebody saying if you have G6 period efficiency, Dr. Iyad Saad actually is also our colleague here in Abu Dhabi. I think if you have G6 period efficiency with congenital methemoglobinemia, the treatment will be only high dose of vitamin C. There will not be uh, yes, methylene yes. Yeah, we run the uh, uh, you know, uh, G6BD done in newborn screen, but we run it very urgently in this case because we cannot start methylene blue in this case in G6BD. And if you look for the cases which has been reported and there is a paper about the hematology trying to have some consensus about the treatment, and every time they say that but they recommend if there is a G6BD deficiency, Go ahead with the scorpic acid, vitamin C. Yeah. Now, now, um, somebody asking about the long term management for this baby. What's what's the agreement was for the long term management yeah. after the hospital? Yeah, it was very uh, unfortunate. You know, we uh, because this is really very rare, and even our colleagues in hematology, we sit together, have a meeting. There is no data, so nobody knows. What we should treat in unit. So we said if it's more than 10, we will uh, we will treat. So ended every two weeks, we give this baby methylene blue. And she came with the methemoglobin in weekly. You know, the, ma the maximum, uh, she stayed 10 days and the hem methemoglobin was 12, 15. So we elect to give, but you know, even the case, there is one case that has been reported and said, they discovered uh, a baby before, and unfortunately, been treating with regular uh, methylene blue and vitamin C, especially with type 2, will not help uh, because the damage happened in uterus, especially the neurological. So our case now almost one year, and she had uh, bad developmental, you know, delayed. So neurologically, she's not really doing very well. Okay. So if you have really answered, we, we will be happy to, to, to share it. But uh, we look to all literature, all what has been written. Mm -hmm. There is no data in unit. There is no data in unit, no data in unit. So we just have our own consensus about the treatment option. And we give methylene blue. It could help, we know. But uh, unfortunately, in our case, we are yani, keeping following her. But she's neurologically is not as an engine, it's not doing well. So just like, you know, uh, try to give whatever available yeah. in our hands. Again, a lot of question, a lot of uh, concerns about the combination of G6PD and the methylene globinemia. And what, yeah. what will be the long-term treatment here? I think it could be only ascorbic acid and uh, vitamin C. There's no yeah. other choice here. Or what do you think? Yes. The interesting thing, the methylene yeah. blue itself can cause hemolysis and can cause also uh, uh, methemoglobinemia. <laughs> yeah. So uh, that's why it's like for ex cases with, uh, let's say it's not the congenital one, let's say the, the iatrogenic or drugs induced, if they are G6BD and you give methylene blue, it may, you know, cause What's more, uh, yeah, more and more. Uh, you know, the, 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 the ferric state will be increasing, so we have more uh, level uh, increase of methemoglobin and more tissue hypoxia. Exactly. Uh, oh, but the, the, uh, um, the concern about the poor developmental outcome that you had in your patient, do you think it's because of the Hypoxemia, long-term hypoxemia, or or because of what that uh, what was the, the cause okay. behind it? Yeah, I don't think it's a hypoxia. I think they have a brain uh, abnormalities, and this is what we're calling the pain. We had initially MRI, which was normal, but we said we need to repeat it because there is a one case in in Riyadh been really uh, published where. They have a first case uh, with uh, uh, with methemoglobin, and the second case they seen and it came positive during the neonatal period, mm -hmm. and they said let's do and they did the same like what we did uh, regular methylene blue. They did an brain Im imaging at uh, and they tried to keep the methemoglobin below ten, 
And what they found, um, MRI changes, especially at the basal ganglia at age of uh, 8 to 12 months. So it's a progressive, mm-hmm. regardless you treat or not to treat. And it was really a big discussion at that point with the family. Uh, did the treatment will help? And we told them very clearly it's unlikely because uh, type 2, they have neurological uh, impairment and, and, and brain abnormalities despite the treatment. Very nice. Yeah, very good. Um, I think I don't have any further here comments or any further uh, questions. So we will wrap this uh, event for tonight. I cannot thank you enough, Dr. Jubara, for joining our forum. It's my pleasure, Dr. Hisham. It's really my pleasure to be with you and with the future. Thank you very much. Inshallah, thank inshallah. You. And thank you. Okay. Thank and send you. me the email. Finally, I want to thank our audience. Send me the email of the one who answered, so I'll get her a gift. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sure. Uh, I'd like to thank our audience also who joined us tonight and waiting for you for our uh, future event, whether it is a new virtual or the, um, the online grand round. And reminder again for the conference from the 10th to 12th of uh, May. Finally, I'd like to thank Earl, uh, Mr. Mufay Shimali and his team, uh, Mr. Hadid, for uh, organizing such good events and uh, wish to see you also soon in our uh, future event. Thank you very much and have a good night. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Jubal. Good, good night. night. Thank you.